Hello, and thank you for joining us today. In this brief presentation, we will discuss the Gimbal UAP video. Briefly, we find robust geometrical evidence that the object proceeded along the highly anomalous flight path described by naval aviators. At the close range given by witnesses, the object's seeming lack of wings or means of propulsion are particularly intriguing and require additional rigorous analysis. The overarching objective of this presentation and the underlying manuscript is to solicit expert feedback with the ultimate goal of solving the years-long mystery of the Gimbal video. The December 2017 publication of the Gimbal video, in tandem with accounts by aviators involved in the encounter, spurred significant congressional and public interest in unidentified anomalous phenomena, the U.S. government's new designation for UFOs. The 34-second Gimbal video was recorded by the infrared targeting pod of a U.S. Navy F-A-18F Super Hornet in January 2015. Infrared targeting pods, in short, are sophisticated camera systems capable of, among other things, seeing in the dark by displaying relative variations in temperature. The gimbal video shows an object, much hotter than its surroundings, skimming above the clouds. Towards the end of the video, as the object appears to slow down, the two air crew and the FA-18 can be heard remarking in astonishment as the object rotates in mid-flight, just as we see here. Importantly, the weapons systems officer, or WIZO, who sits in the back seat of the jet's two-person cockpit, describes the object proceeding against strong westerly winds. In early 2019, amid robust congressional interest, the aviator who recorded the gimbal video briefed professional staff members with the Senate Armed Services Committee. Two declassified versions, each with varying redactions of a document summarizing this briefing, provide a wealth of supporting data regarding the incident. In short, the encounter occurred several hundred miles off the coast of Jacksonville, Florida, at the very end of a complex training mission. While the mission commenced during daylight hours, the gimbal incident occurred after sunset, in the dark. The report, combined with the cockpit audio, describes an unknown object accompanied by a, quote, fleet of four to six smaller objects approaching the USS Roosevelt aircraft carrier, quote, from the east, and ultimately reversing course by departing, quote, back towards the east. Importantly, by maintaining a, quote, stable radar lock on the object and ensuring that the contact, quote, was not a false hit, the aircrew had ranging data, which refers to the distance between their fighter jet and the object, with references to, quote, the closest point of intercept and, quote, closest the air vehicles came, the documentary evidence suggests that the Navy aircrew flew in relatively close proximity to the unknown objects. Long before the documents described in the previous slide were declassified and released, former Navy fighter pilot Ryan Graves, who was airborne during the encounter, described the gimbal object's flight path as he observed it via a top-down, God's-eye-view radar display. Lieutenant Graves describes the gimbal object flying in one direction, then abruptly reversing direction without a radius of turn, a highly anomalous maneuver. This aligns generally with the account given to Senate staff by the aviator who recorded the video, in which the object was described as, quote, coming from the east and ultimately heading, quote, back towards the east at the end of the encounter. Importantly, while we do not have access to the raw radar data, the witness's estimate of the distance between the fighter jet and the object is approximately six to eight nautical miles. Now, a brief note on context. The gimbal incident occurred as dozens of naval aviators had daily, years-long encounters with highly anomalous objects that remained stationary, frequently in strong winds aloft, or moved at hundreds of miles per hour, all while remaining airborne for extreme durations. Now, the gimbal video includes important information which can be used to mathematically reconstruct the encounter. First, we know the FA-18 fighter jet's altitude and speed. The plane is flying at 25,000 feet at a speed of roughly 0.6 Mach, or just over half the speed of sound. The bank angle indicates the rate at which the plane is turning to the left. Combined, this information can be used to reconstruct the FA-18's trajectory. Additionally, we have various camera parameters providing information on the position of the target object. The elevation angle remains constant, at negative two degrees, indicating that the camera is looking slightly down below the jet's nose. The azimuth indicates the position of the object relative to the FA-18's nose on a horizontal plane. 
It varies from 54 degrees to the left of the jet's nose to 7 degrees to the right as the FA-18 banks left towards the gimbal object over the course of the video. The camera is set to a narrow field of view with a two-time zoom. This is the camera's maximum zoom setting and corresponds to an extremely narrow field of view of 0.35 degrees. A cloud layer is visible in the back, which also provides useful information. The clouds can be used to refine the relative position of the FA-18 and the object by counting how many fields of view are scanned by the camera over the course of the video. And in total, the camera scans about nine fields of view. As mentioned previously, the cockpit audio also provides critical information, including wind direction and speed, as well as that the unknown objects are moving against the wind. Contrary to Department of Defense statements indicating that the incident occurred January 21st, 2015, our best guess, based on nuanced historical weather data and several other factors, is that the gimbal incident actually occurred the evening of January 24th, local Eastern Standard Time. This is discussed in further detail in the manuscript. Utilizing the on-screen information, we can reconstruct the FA-18's trajectory, which is shown at the upper left in nautical miles as viewed from above. Because the jet remains at a constant altitude, its trajectory can be visualized on a two-dimensional plane. Based on this flight path, we can use the camera angles as well as the background cloud motion to trace lines of sight at several points of the video. A line of sight indicates where the camera is looking at any given time, based on the azimuth and elevation angles relative to the aircraft's position. Here we plot the lines of sight every 10 frames, which represents three lines of sight per second, due to the gimbal video's 30 frame per second frame rate. The lines of sight are shown in color, starting with the first frame in blue to the last frame in red. Here they are shown within 10 nautical miles from the FA-18 to highlight the range provided by witnesses. Lines of sight include an infinite number of flight paths, but we can constrain potential flight paths for the gimbal event. In particular, we want to verify if the trajectory observed on radar, that is the anomalous stop and reversal of direction within 10 nautical miles, can be retrieved in the lines of sight. To investigate this, we place the object at the refined range provided by the aviators, starting at 8 nautical miles. From that initial point, we tested a range of straight trajectories that traverse the lines of sight. We also tested different wind directions, as well as various iterations of the object's heading relative to the wind, that are roughly consistent with an object going against the wind. For this example, and as our best guess flight path, we select the path that is consistent with the object's approximately 15% increase in size over the course of the video, which indicates that the FA-18 is closing on the target object. As shown in the figure in the bottom right, there's a range of wind directions and object headings that are consistent with the change in apparent size, and the flight path we present here is in the middle of this range. The scenario that conforms with the many constraints described here corresponds to a wind direction coming from about 35 degrees to the left of the initial heading of the FA-18, noted by the blue arrow in the top left figure. The object has a slight offset of 15 degrees relative to this wind direction. As can be seen in the lower left, an object proceeding in a straight line along the lines of sight must take what is best described as a vertical U-turn to follow the increasing clustering of the lines of sight towards the end of the video. Although the example we show here is only one potential flight path, all straight trajectories within 10 nautical miles that go left to right through the lines of sight must reverse direction along the vertical, as illustrated here. This flight path is therefore a robust illustration of what the object's trajectory would look like if it was within the 10 nautical mile range provided by the witnesses. Now let's take a closer look at the characteristics of this flight path. This graph shows airspeed in blue and ground speed in green, both in knots as a function of time as measured by video frame. Airspeed is the object speed in its local air mass. Ground speed, on the other hand, accounts for wind and is the speed as seen from an observer on the ground. Ground speed is the speed observed by radar and therefore 
what was observed by aviators on their overhead radar display. Because the object is initially proceeding against the wind, its ground speed is lower than its intrinsic airspeed. At the beginning of the video, the object's ground speed is approximately 300 knots and gradually decreases to zero around frame 720. Interestingly, this is when the first change of the object's orientation is observed in the video. At this moment, the object would be seen stopping on the overhead radar display before proceeding in the opposite direction as its actual speed passes below wind speed. This actual speed of the object reaches a minimum shortly thereafter, coinciding with the long rotation observed in the video. This is particularly interesting when compared to Lieutenant Ryan Graves' description of the event. According to Lieutenant Graves, the gimbal object stopped, as observed on radar, before rotating, as seen in the video. In short, the delay between the object appearing to stop on the overhead radar display and the rotation observed in the video can be explained by the influence of wind. Importantly, in order to follow the lines of sight and the so-called vertical U-turn, the object needs to climb by a few hundred feet in the second half of the video. Since it takes a fighter jet several thousand feet to execute such a maneuver, this is further evidence of highly anomalous flight characteristics. If we plot this potential flight path in the local frame of reference, which is in its local air mass, neglecting the influence of wind, it looks like this. Here the compression of the lines of sight occurs later and is a remarkable match with the timing of the rotation of the object observed in the gimbal video, seen here. This path corresponds to the blue curve in the speed graph above. As described previously, the object's long continuous rotation is noted by the yellow shaded region in the upper figure. And as noted previously, the object needs to climb by a few hundred feet in this scenario. Intriguingly, close analysis of the video yields evidence of this climb. Here we see three frames from the video, each two seconds apart. The images are stitched together to maintain a continuous and flat cloud cover, as can be observed from the rise of the object above the orange line, as well as the rise of the artificial horizon and velocity vector above the red line. This segment of the video, which coincides with the vertical U-turn predicted in the reconstructed close flight path, corresponds to a slight rise of the object above the cloud layer. This is further evidence that the so-called vertical U-turn flight path corroborates witness accounts. Now, a brief note on alternative theories for the gimbal video. At a distance of 30 nautical miles, we retrieve level flight paths that proceed in a vaguely straight line, reflecting possible trajectories by conventional aircraft. However, we find that for paths at constant altitude at this distance, the airspeed must increase substantially over the course of the video, from 300 to 450 knots in just 34 seconds. This scenario also requires a chain of misidentifications by military personnel, with a mysterious plane not identified by a Navy carrier strike group amid pre-combat deployment workups. An airliner seems implausible, given the rapid acceleration, infrared signature, low 19,000 foot altitude at that range, and lack of electronic identification. A fighter jet from the carrier strike group locked by air while flying in the distance may sound more plausible, but a jet at that range is extremely small in the field of view. This scenario would require an extraordinarily large oval-shaped infrared signature that seems disconnected from the size and shape of jet exhaust. This is illustrated in the figure in the lower left. Perhaps most improbably, this mysterious distant plane would have mimicked the close flight path observed on the overhead radar display in its lines of sight. Indeed, the fact that we retrieve the stop and reversal of direction described previously at the range provided by the aviators means that the radar returns seen on the aviator's overhead radar display were linked to the locked target and not independent of it. The only explanation for a scenario like this is that a distant plane actively spoofed the FA-18's radar, injecting false radar tracks precisely along the lines of sight that appear to reduce the faraway jet's actual distance from the FA-18. This scenario requires an unidentified hostile aircraft in a Navy training range or an electronic warfare test on unwitting aviators, both of which are highly speculative. The latter, in particular, does not align with pre-deployment training procedures. 
While the distant jet and so-called infrared glare theory proposed by UAP investigator Mick West is described in far more detail in our manuscript, we find that it implies much more than a simple misidentification and an optical artifact of the targeting pod. Of note, two Raytheon engineers to whom we presented the video did not confirm that the object was an optical artifact, nor that its rotation is a product of the targeting pod. Core elements of Mr. West's theory. To summarize, Geometrical reconstructions of the gimbal video retrieve flight paths that align closely with witness accounts. At the distance given by naval aviators, there is a remarkable match between the reconstructed flight path and the anomalous direction reversal with no radius of turn described by Lieutenant Graves. Of equal importance, the long continuous rotation observed toward the end of the gimbal video matches the reconstructed vertical U-turn. Additionally, we see evidence of the altitude increase required by this maneuver. In sum, this is compelling evidence that the object in the gimbal video was within 10 nautical miles of the FA-18, just as described by witnesses. At this close distance, the object's highly anomalous flight characteristics become apparent. At 25,000 feet, air density is significantly lower than at sea level, meaning that an object traveling at the low air speeds observed would require large wings. However, no wings are apparent in the video. Moreover, as witnesses note, the infrared video shows no exhaust plume or other propulsion signatures typical of conventional aircraft. And yet, despite the apparent absence of wings or propulsion, the object reversed direction vertically in only a few hundred feet, a maneuver that would take a fighter jet several thousand feet to execute. Similarly, at the eight nautical ball range provided by witnesses, the object's infrared signature is approximately 15 to 20 feet in length along its longest axis. This suggests that the gimbal object is markedly smaller than any conventional aircraft. In sum, these are highly anomalous characteristics that require rigorous further analysis. Ultimately, our goal is to solve the years-long mystery of the gimbal video, the publication of which resulted in significant public interest and legislative action on unidentified anomalous phenomena. To that end, we encourage experts in relevant fields to engage with the data presented here and in far greater detail in our manuscript. To that end, we will include our contact information and look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much.